it has been some time, but the media hasn't particularly picked up on it, despite all my efforts, uh, uh, mainly because uh, the, while the BEA does, the Bureau of Economic Analysis, they're the ones who put out the uh, quarterly GDP statistics. Um, and uh, so they release GDP, but gross output is kind of buried in the press releases that they put out. It's, it's after they talk about GDP and they, and they actually don't release it until the third estimate of GDP. And then down in the copy, it says, by the way, there's this statistic called gross output, GO, that measures spending at all stages of production. So what do we mean by that? Well, GDP measures final output only. So it's only the finished products, the hat I'm wearing, the glasses you're wearing, uh, things that you buy a, 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 as a consumer or as a business or as government, uh, that's GDP and it's about 22, $23 trillion. But it, it, it leaves out the uh, supply chain and the supply chain is bigger than GDP itself. So, so uh, gross output is a measure of GDP plus the supply chain. So it measures spending at all stages of production and that's over $50, $50 trillion. So it's double GDP and it's much more volatile, and it also helps predict where the economy's headed. Welcome to the Wigan Sessions. I'm Addison Wigan, I'm your host. Today I have with me a good friend, uh, Mark Skousen, Dr. Mark Skousen. And uh, really what I want to do today is catch up with him on a lot of the projects he's been working on. Uh, you, you just, uh, well, first of all, welcome, Mark. Thank you for joining me. It's your birthday. Happy birthday. Thank you. In fact, uh, October 19th is a very memorable date because it's the anniversary of the stock market crash in 1987. And I turned 40 years old at that date and had a big party with Alec Green and Diego Vitilla and some of the other brokers at the time, and they were all very nervous. So my party kind of ended uh, quickly because they had uh, margin calls to deal with and, and stuff like that. But I, I was feeling very good about it because six weeks earlier, I'd given a sell all stocks uh, alert uh, that nobody followed, but nevertheless, it, it was sent out there. So I was considered one of the few people that predicted the crash. And what, one of the things that I should point out is I have not, uh, my argument is that we will have no more crashes afterwards. Well, bear markets, but not crashes that fall 22% in a day. And the reason is, is because of the uh, plunge protection team that's put together by the government to intervene if, if that happens. And the circuit breakers, you know, if the market drops 7% in a day, they stop trading. So there's a lot of reasons why they will create a bear market scenario, but not an absolute crash like we had in 87. And I've, I've been proven right on that prediction since then. Well, it's worth pointing out that you made that prediction in forecasts and strategies, and you've been publishing that newsletter for a number of years. Thank yeah, since 1980, uh, yeah. since Ronald Reagan was elected president, I uh, started my newsletter. So I'm in my 43rd year. It's pretty, uh, year. pretty yeah. amazing. My goal is to keep uh, writing that until 2030 at least. And so I can write a book called 50 Years on Wall Street. Yeah, that's nice. Yeah, I actually, one of my favorite uh, projects, I have it on my desk is um, the uh, Viennese Waltz down, <laughs> down, Wall, down Street. Wall Street. And then there's also, you did a, like a special report that was just about how Austrian economics works on Wall Street. Yeah, and, uh, and I have those on my desk because I refer to them on a regular basis. Thank you. <laughs> um, but, all right. So forecast and strategies. You are you were also just named to a, uh, a a chair at Chapman University. Why don't you tell me about that a little bit? Yeah, I've uh, I've always had one foot in the academic world. I have a PhD in monetary economics at George Washington University back in 1977. So. In addition to my uh, writing uh, my newsletter, Forecasts and Strategies, uh, I also have been a teacher at universities or, or colleges. I've taught at Rollins College here in Winter Park, Florida. I've taught at Columbia Business School 
uh, and Columbia University, Barnard College up in New York, um, taught at uh, uh, at Sing Sing Penitentiary for 10 years as part of Mercy College with my wife, Joanne. And now I have this position at Chapman. I, I got there in 2014 uh, teaching uh, at Chapman University, which is a small liberal arts uh, college, now university, that Jim Doty uh, was responsible for uh, making it a success. It was a small liberal arts college, and then he made it a university. He got Vernon Smith, the Nobel Prize economist, to come there. They have a business school. They have a film school. Uh, they have a law school. And so uh, uh, I was made a presidential fellow. And then Jim Doty was trying to create a chair for me and finally got uh, uh, Ron Spogli, who is a uh, ambassador to Italy under George W. Bush, and then uh, is uh, uh, runs a hedge fund. Uh, and uh, through the hedge fund that they created this chair. So it's called the Doty Spogli Chair, Endowed Chair of Free Enterprise. And they appointed me the first chair. So I'm thrilled with that opportunity. So uh, I'm on both sides of the uh, continent, if you will. I'm, I'm, uh, 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 I have a home in here in Florida where I am right now. And then out in California, we have a home and I teach, my wife and I teach at Chapman Chapman University with this endowed chair. So I'm thrilled that an adjunct has done well. <laughs> well, you know what, I, I want to congratulate you. I, I have done so by email, but um, this seems like a good opportunity to, to congratulate you and have a Thank lot you. of people pay attention to, to all the work that you've done uh, up to this point. And we're going to talk about more things. Uh, one of the things that you mentioned to me right before we started today is that you, uh, you, you, uh, you created what you think is a better uh, measure of the economy called gross output instead of GDP. The government has adopted it, and, um, and you were just telling me the media is not really paying attention, but, but it's a different way of measuring uh, the productive productivity of the, the economy. And uh, the last time you were on the Wigan sessions, we talked about it, so you kind of explained it, but if you could just give us an update on, on what's happening, because I think it was like maybe May or something that we talked and, and they, uh, the government had just adopted that measurement. Yeah, they actually uh, adopted it on a quarterly basis, just like GDP. Um, uh, back in April of 2014. So, uh, oh, wow. okay. well, uh, yeah, we talked it has about been, it. <laughs> it has been some time, but the media hasn't particularly picked up on it, despite all my efforts, uh, uh, mainly because uh, the, while the BEA does, the Bureau of Economic Analysis, they're the ones who put out the uh, quarterly GDP statistics. Um, and uh, so they released GDP, but gross output is kind of buried in the press releases that they put out. It's it's after they talk about GDP and they and they actually don't release it until the third estimate of GDP. And then down in the copy, it says, by the way, there's this statistic called gross output, GO, that measures spending at all stages of production. So what do we mean by that? Well. GDP measures final output only. So it's only the finished products, the hat I'm wearing, the glasses you're wearing, uh, things that you buy a, 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 as a consumer or as a business or as government, uh, that's GDP. And it's about 22, $23 trillion. But it, it, it leaves out the uh, supply chain and the supply chain is bigger than GDP itself. So, so, uh, Gross output is a measure of GDP plus the supply chain. So it measures spending at all stages of production, and that's over $50, $50 trillion. So it's double GDP, and it's much more volatile, and it also helps predict where the economy is headed. I'll give you an example. In the last two quarters, GDP has declined. Real GDP has been dropping, and so theoretically, we're in a recession, a mild recession at, at best. But geo continues to grow. And so that means the supply chain is very vibrant. Uh, business spending is uh, continuing to grow. Why? Because there are shortages in the supply chain and the economy is 
gradually responding to that. Uh, so GO is growing. So there is no recession according to GO. So it's very interesting, uh, the difference in the statistics. And the reason the media doesn't cover it is because it's buried. Now I'm having a meeting uh, soon with uh, BEA officials, and we're going to talk about uh, making making GO more prominent. Basically, look at it this way: in a financial statement, there's a top line and a bottom line. The top line is sales or revenues. The bottom line is earnings or net profit. Um, so that's the kind of thing that we need with national income accounting. Uh, GO measures spending at all stages of production and GDP is just final output. So uh, it's it's an important statistic. I call it top line and bottom line in national income accounting. And I believe that within the next 10 years, uh, GO will be quoted equally as GDP is top line and bottom line every quarter. Did you, uh, there's been a lot of talk about supply chain interruptions uh, after the lockdowns and then throughout the pandemic, and then they're kind of working their way out. I've written a lot about it because uh, I'm looking at like, you know, the backup of um, of uh, freighter, freighters off Long Beach and that kind of thing. Um, and then mm -hmm. the, the there's been a lack of uh, truckers to drive stuff around. Do, have you seen, it sounds like you're saying that um, that gross output has increased despite all of the kind of headline news. Yeah, the, it's really an anomaly because usually yeah. GO and GDP move together, not not by the same amount, but they tend to move together. And this time they're moving in opposite directions. And I think the reason is, is because uh, the market, the free market does work and they find uh, free enterprise finds solutions to the supply chain shortages. Um, it's it's gradual, but the fact that it's happening suggests that uh, that business spending is doing much better than consumer spending, um, and the problem is gradually going away. Uh, but but how? I, I guess I'm wondering how GO like measures that. Uh, if you could just kind of be specific about it, just. I'm trying to understand it myself, so <laughs> it'd be helpful well, if you could give it an example. Yeah, you, like you, it's, you, if it's gradual, then uh, what numbers are we looking at? In other words, the the shortages are still there, but they're they're being reduced, gradually reduced, uh, okay. uh, and uh, the market is solving this problem. So that's basically what we're saying. So whether it's uh, uh, shipping, uh, transportation that you mentioned whether it's manufacturing, uh, getting this paper you need for print. You know, there's this huge shortage on paper, as you know, for the printing of books. Mm -hmm. And that's gradually shortening as well. So instead of six months, it's now three months. Uh, so uh, those are just some examples of the kind of thing that's going on. The shortage in chips, for example, uh, is gradually being uh, uh, solved. And uh, so, um, that's, that's the way to look at it. If you look at every one of the categories and they break down these categories into like 34 different categories of agriculture and manufacturing and technology and so forth, the, the shortages are being reduced, which means that the market uh, is expanding uh, to solve this problem and it's moving much faster than final, final use. Um, the, uh supply chain interruptions have been blamed in large part for some of the inflation obviously we have government overspending during the pandemic and uh low interest rates leading up to the pandemic um what how much do you account supply chain interruptions for uh for the inflation that we've been going through for the last two years yeah no i it, and that's what has incentivized free enterprise to solve the shortage problem is because prices have been increasing faster uh, in the supply chain up until recently. Now they're starting to come back down. Uh, so that's a good sign as well that the supplies are, are coming into the marketplace. And uh, so GO is basically predicting that uh, it, there is um, a strong uh, you know, recession is is certainly around the corner. 
uh, I don't think we've reached it yet. Um, but and I also think prices are are starting to uh, weaken a little bit. That is price inflation, I think will be coming down because if you look at Fed policy, they're not only raising interest rates, but the money supply is not growing like it used to. So they are squeezing the money supply as well. Those are two indicators that with the lags that Milton Friedman talked about, six month lag, usually six to nine months, uh, that's when you get the effects. Uh, that's when you get the recessionary uh, uh, movement. And so that's, that's where we're headed. My personal opinion is that the Fed will, will panic at one point, there's going to be an emerging market debt crisis, because everything is paid in dollars and the dollar is strengthening. So that's, that's a sign that uh, I think like 1982, when we had the Mexican debt crisis, that's when Paul Volcker uh, reversed his policy and went from tight money to easy money and the economy recovered, the stock market recovered, the bond market recovered and so forth. That's, that's what I expect in 2023. But you're saying that that's going to happen after uh, a recessionary period because, because of the lag. Um, yeah, they're yeah. tightening now. And one of the ways that they tighten, right, is um, by uh, reducing uh, market purchases of uh, treasuries. And at one point, they were even buying equities, right? The Fed. Well, you, no, I don't think they ever bought equities. They bought uh, mortgage securities and treasuries. Yeah. Those are the only two that I'm aware of. They certainly have the power to buy equities. But they're selling now, right? They're they're yeah. reducing their quantitative easing, their their assets on their books. Uh, they're it's very slow, and and I don't think they're going to come near to uh, re reducing it substantially. Uh, but they're selling rather than buying uh, government securities. So that's that's uh, another sign of tightening. Yeah, and so uh, what what you were describing before is when they have to change their policy, and they actually they actually uh, release it in their minutes and they explain what they're doing. Um, a lot of the press anyway, and I've even used the word myself, uh, is the Fed pivot. That's when they're when they're going to make a change to uh, to their tightening policies. Um, and you're saying that we're going to I'm just trying to get this right, if I understand it. So you're saying that we're going to go through a recessionary period, but that at some point they're going to have to uh, they're going to have to ease up again. Yeah, that's exactly. really the only tool they have, right? Yeah, uh, and that's and that's like 1982 when the yeah. uh, Paul Volcker same thing when he pushed rates up to 21 percent, but then you had this uh, Mexican debt crisis in the summer of '82, and that's when the Fed threw in the towel saying, oh, we, we probably, and that's the thing, the Fed goes, goes uh, overdoes it on both sides, overdo the- yeah. Well, uh, they're the, late first. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. And, and unfortunately that's not changed. I, I, asked, I asked people, I say, are we ever gonna get a Federal Reserve policy that is stabilizing, that doesn't go overboard, that just uh, steadily, you know, Milton Friedman made this point, that sound money, you want a system where the Fed does not engage in easy money, then tight money, then easy money, then tight money. How about just stable money? And he believed that increasing the money supply at a steady rate. The problem is we, we don't know what the money supply is anymore. So that's so then they focused uh, on interest rates and now they focus on quantitative, uh, uh, on buying and selling of financial assets. So the Fed is uh, there. They're struggling to to get to a position where they can just be a stable policy and people can ignore the Fed. And we haven't, if anything, it's gotten worse, not better. Yeah, and it's become a public institution too. Like the minutes, I, you know, just writing about the financial markets, the the amount of attention that is put on Jay Powell, Janet Yellen before him, um, it's it's crazy. I've been doing this for like 30 years. You've been doing it much longer than I have, but the amount of like uh, attention that is paid to the words that come out of their mouths has- And yeah, it didn't, it really yeah. didn't help that Ben Bernanke was given the Nobel prize. I thought that was a major blunder uh, yeah. to- Well, it's kind of weird, right? 
give it to a man who oversaw the greatest financial crisis we faced since the Great Depression, and they're giving him the Nobel Prize because he thinks he they think he did a good job. Well, he not only helped it happen uh, because he, as Fed Chairman, he and Alan Greenspan, both of them allowed the subprime no doc loan crisis in the mortgage securities and triple a uh, report i mean you look at all of that sort of thing and you say what what in the heck was going on and then he and then ben bernanke is the one who started with the quantitative easing and the buying of assets now 4.6 trillion dollars on the fed balance sheet and so he saddled the fed with this huge debt and how are you going to get out of that so it's he definitely, in my opinion, did not deserve the Nobel Prize. In fact, I think he should have been fired as Fed chairman because he allowed the subprime loan debacle to continue. Well, he popularized the term helicopter money, too, which went during the pandemic. They actually did <laughs> just send checks to people. That's True, insane. But that wasn't the Fed. The Fed didn't do that. Oh, well, I know that. But, he, he Treasury. but he's that. the one who called Hank. Uh, Paulson on the phone and said, help, we need uh, TARP money. And uh, TARP actually paid itself off. I mean, they completely paid off the TARP money, but the Fed is saddled with this huge debt and uh, it's a problem. I mean, your reckoning is gonna come at some point here. Yeah. Uh, before we began today, we were talking about your book, uh, Making of Modern Economics. So uh, it, you're now going into a fourth edition of that. How would you place um, Ben Bernanke in, in the fourth edition? You're going to have to write about him somehow, right? <laughs> well, I do talk about the Fed and, and the quantitative easing. of The fourth edition, and I, I'm very pleased, by the way, this, this has become a very popular textbook. And just, a, you know, you yourself as a, as a, uh, a layman read it. And, uh, and found it entertaining and educational at the same time. It's a unique book with, uh, with pictures, uh, photographs, portraits, uh, stories. Yeah, I, part of what I like about it is you're telling human stories about the people who have come up with the ideas that we follow in economics. It's a yeah, very I, real, uh, it's a real and readable account of, of people's lives in in economics, which I, yeah, I just found when, when I was younger and I was trying to learn all this stuff, not that I know anything now, but um, when I was <laughs> learning about it, it, it was really helpful for me to learn about uh, people's lives. And, and I was impressed <laughs> at the time. I, I mean, I'm pretty sure I didn't even know you at the time, but, but when I was reading, I was impressed that you were able to collect the details about people's uh, the economist lives that you that you did and i and i still wonder to this day how you did that <laughs> yeah it's it's my most creative project as far as book writing is concerned uh and and one of the reasons i wrote it was because i was dissatisfied with the robert Heilbrunner's book the worldly philosophers which was the most popular history of the great economic thinkers and we're talking here about adam smith and karl marx and and John Maynard Keynes and Milton Friedman and people like that. And it's really, I, the more I got into it, the more I was really intrigued by their, their personal stories and also the fact that I think their personal lives affected the way they wrote economics. So I put the two together, uh, you know, Adam Smith uh, living during the Enlightenment uh, that affected uh, his economics, uh, Karl Marx, uh, uh, suffering through the industrial revolution and how de uh, uh, destabilizing that was in terms of people moving from uh, rural areas into the cities and the pollution and all that sort of thing. You could see why someone could write some uh, a, a negative comments about industrial revolution. And Keynes during the Great Depression, how he was wiped out financially and he discovered a, a theory that would explain why he was... Uh, financially destroyed personally. So I, I developed a lot of these theories uh, uh, that came out from their personal lives. So I combined the two and uh, also came up, I think, with some clever titles that would draw people in. So for Adam Smith, it's called It All Started With Adam. With Karl Marx, it's called Marx Madness. 
based on March Madness uh, in basketball. Uh, the, yeah, Austri readable. the Austrians were called uh, a, a, a out of the blue Danube. Uh, and Milton Friedman is called Milton's Paradise and Keynes was called the Keynes Mutiny. Um, <laughs> so there, there was lots of fun titles and storytelling and pictures and stuff. And by the way, if people are interested in uh, getting a copy of this, these, my book and others at a discount, I do have a website called scousenbooks.com that people can go to and they can order all of my books. I autograph all of my books. Uh, I sign them and uh, you can get them at a discount over the, the retail price, which is often rather high when it comes to textbooks. Scousenbooks.com. Correct. So I'm going to spell that out because uh, it's interesting. <laughs> S-K-O-U-S-E-N books.com. Right, scousenbooks.com. All right. Uh, I want to ask you, you, you brought up earlier um, your project at Sing Sing, and um, you and I were communicating by email probably, I don't know, six weeks ago or something, and you were talking about uh, the success that you had. I, I think one of the students uh, rang the bell at the NYSE and, uh, or yeah, Sean Pico. yeah. and I, I was just intrigued that, like I've known you for a long time, we've met at conferences and we've spoken <laughs> at podiums at the same time and, and, uh, and you're doing this at the same time. Like I didn't know about your work with Joanna at Sing Sing Prison, so I was um, I was just fascinated. So if you want to extol your, uh, you said that you're very proud of the of the work that you've done there. So I'd like to hear about it. Yeah, uh, this was uh, I was president of Fee. That's what got us to New York Foundation for Economic Education, the oldest free market think tank. And that lasted a year because I was not very good at fundraising. And then after that, I started teaching at Columbia University, Columbia Business School. And then this opportunity arose through my wife. My wife was the first one involved with Sing Sing Penitentiary. This is a state prison rather notorious uh, because it's a maximum security prison and people are in there for murder or worse. And but they had developed a rehabilitation program through Mercy College, where they would get a college degree in psychology and sociology and so forth. And they needed an economics professor. They, they needed someone to teach economics. And so uh, my wife volunteered me. She teaches English and writing at, at Sing Sing. So for 10, actually about 12 years, my wife and I would go a couple times a week to Sing Sing, which is up the river, as the phrase goes. They're, it's right on the Hudson River. Uh, in Ossining, New York, and we entered this prison, and you had to go through five lots uh, uh, to get into the classroom, and there we would teach for several hours twice a week uh, college courses, Joanne English literature and writing to improve their writing style, and me, English, or economics and business, so that they, when they got their college degree from Mercy College, they had a big graduation ceremony and they had big name speakers uh, uh, to commencement addresses. And uh, so they would have, uh, they had Warren Buffett there one year. That's my chance to meet Warren Buffett because his uh, sister, uh, Doris Buffett was a big uh, financial supporter. And by the way, all this, uh, the Sing Sing program was through a nonprofit called Hudson Link and Sean Pika, who appeared ringing the bell in the New York Stock Exchange, is a former inmate. And so he came out uh, after having uh, been in prison for 20 years for murder. Uh, he graduated from this program. And uh, so they, there was no government money involved other than the prison itself. And uh, so uh, lots of people were helpful in, in that. And we basically volunteered. We were paid a couple thousand dollars to, to teach, but it really wasn't much money. So we were volunteering. And it was just a tremendous opportunity to teach free market economics to inmates. And uh, it, it was really a uh, very uh, enjoyable experience to 
see how these men who as young men had made a mistake, they recognized their mistake. And here they were getting an education. Uh, they also had a ministry program, which I think was very helpful so that they could see the error of their ways. And the recidivism rate is dramatic. It's only like 3%, 3% return to prison after yeah, uh, that was struck, college degree program. Yeah, I was struck by that uh, comment. You mentioned the recidiv recidivism rate uh, compared to like the general population in prisons around the country. It's like dramatically improved because people are, um, they're learning how to be citizens really, right? Yeah, and they're, they're learning a skill so that they, when they get out, they don't have to deal with, drug, be a drug dealer again. Yeah. Uh, so there were a lot of things that were uh, the college degree program, the ministry program, everything really helped because the recidivism rate normally is after five years, it's like 67 percent, something like that. They and end just up back, clear, in, back in prison again. Yeah. But recidivism means they they do something bad again and, and get busted and <laughs> go back. Yeah, to jail. Exactly. My yeah. son is actually <clears throat> my son, Tim, who's a movie maker in Utah. He actually did a documentary called uh, Zero Percent. At the time, the recidivism rate was zero percent. And uh, then HBO picked that up and, and called it the University of Sing Sing. So there's been some publicity about it. And of course, when you when you see uh, Sean Pika of Hudson Link ring, ringing the bell of the New York Stock Exchange, you know they've arrived. And a lot of, a lot of uh, state and federal institutions are now getting involved in college degree programs. And it's good, although I, I don't believe federal money or state money should be used. It should all be volunteer contributions. Mm -hmm. uh, but there, in any case, uh, there, there does seem to be, uh, this is a big success story in criminal justice. Yeah, that's great. I, I'm really proud of you for doing that. You and Joanna, you, you guys have done phenomenal work in my opinion. How would you compare the uh, the inmates to the um, the attendees to Freedom Fest? <laughs> <laughs> Normally, I'm comparing them to uh, students at Columbia University. Uh, and uh, and by the way, I would I put them so the, a lot of these kids. They realize they're mistaken and they were bright. They are bright kids uh, and they graduated with very good degrees. Uh, we have had a couple of uh, inmates who have graduated and uh, are now citizens free, free from prison, and they've, a few of them have attended uh, Freedom Fest. Uh, but Freedom Fest is, um, uh, I tell you, uh, what we try to do at Freedom Fest, my idea, I, this the thing got started in 2000 and actually got started when I was president of FEE. We, we had did Fee Fest, and uh, we had Ben Stein as our keynote speaker. And the idea was to bring together uh, people, uh, not only the free market think tanks and freedom organizations, but do it on a retail level, invite citizens and attendees from all over the world, authors and professors and business leaders, and, and put together this once a year conference where we network, we learn from each other, we socialize and we celebrate liberty. We all live busy lives, but can we all come together just once a year for three or four uh, days and, uh, and, and re redevelop or develop uh, better our, our enthusiasm for the freedom movement? Because I, I've always felt that Freedom was on decline, uh, that we were losing freedoms gradually with higher taxes, higher regulations. Uh, we're losing free speech. There's all kinds of examples where we're, you know, there, there was this uh, uh, ex-Bolivian president who said more and more everything is being either prohibited or mandated. So we're kind of being squeezed from both sides. Uh, lots of prohibition, especially during the pandemic, you know, everything had to be mandated. Nobody, nobody said, would you like to wear a mask? No, it was, you will wear a mask, social distancing. You will have the vaccine. Uh, mandates, prohibitions, uh, uh, 
unfortunately we backed away from that, but the powers are still there. The executive powers are still there. And these are the kinds of things I was worried about in, in creating Freedom Fest. And it's been a big success. I mean, it's taken a long time for people to kind of realize we needed to come together. Our, our best reference is Ben Franklin who said, uh, either we either, we either hang together or we, we will surely hang separately. Uh, so we need to come together once a year. That's the idea. Everybody has their own agenda, their own program, but can we all come together? And by the way, we are for profit. Freedom Fest is for profit. We are not a nonprofit. So we don't do any fundraising. You pay the price to come in. If you're a nonprofit, you want to fundraise, more power to you. We'll help you out. We're not going to compete with you to raise money. Uh, last year, or actually last year you were in Las Vegas, but the year before that you were in South Dakota. Next year, you're going to be in Memphis, I understand. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So the idea. Me, we talked about this a little yeah. bit before. You, you had left Vegas uh, during the pandemic because they were locking everybody down and South Dakota seemed like a good place. Then you went back to Vegas, I think, and then and now you're uh, you're in Memphis. And I'm assuming that has something to do with the tax rate in Tennessee. <laughs> Just because there's a lot of people that are moving there for, for that, good tax policy. That's, that's true. But basically what, what we've decided, uh, we used to, the Freedom Fest, when, when we really got started again uh, in 2007 as a, as a for-profit event, uh, we decided to have it every year in Vegas because they were the most libertarian town in. They had the cheapest rooms and every flights were nonstop from all over. Um, and so there's a lot of reasons why we wanted Vegas and Vegas has really improved their, their image uh, with five-star restaurants and hotels, uh, their entertainment and so forth. It's not the seedy town that it used to be. Still, we were shocked by the lockdown. In fact, they, they strung us along and they, uh, the hotel that we were at, uh, the Paris resort, um, part of Caesars, uh, they promised us that we'd be able to pull this off. And then two weeks before the conference, they shut us down. The governor uh, was, was just terrible in terms of uh, the draconian rules and regulations. So we decided the next year not to take any chances. So we tried South Dakota. We got the biggest crowd ever. I mean, lots of people had never been to Mount Rushmore and it was just a beautiful environment. We took over every hotel uh, room in the city, in, in Rapid City, South Dakota. We had Governor Christy Nome there. Uh, Larry Elder came, and we had a lot of really interesting people. And uh, it was just a big success. So we decided that uh, every other year we'll be in Vegas, and then we're going to choose another city across the country to do Freedom Fest. And so that's why we chose Memphis for next year. We were in Vegas this year again. We were at the Mirage Hotel. Again, a very big crowd of, of 2,600 people. And we had John Cleese, the British comedian, as our uh, uh, keynote. And he was just tremendous. And in fact, uh, Nick Gillespie's interview with him at Reason has gone viral with 2 million uh, views on I, YouTube. I wasn't even aware of that. Yeah. That yeah, no. Very, it was just extremely successful. So we're in Memphis this next year, just to, it is in Tennessee. We were going to do Nashville, but Nashville, the hotel rooms are like $300 a night. It's just very expensive. So we chose uh, Memphis where Elvis has Graceland and the Martin Luther King Museum and Beale Street. Uh, we're very excited. We have over 400 people who've already signed up. So we, we think we'll have a record crowd for that as well. Fred, Fred Smith the founder and CEO, the libertarian uh, CEO of, uh, uh, of FedEx is based there. So we're hoping that he will help out and, and welcome us. We haven't confirmed him yet, but we, we just think that, look, there's a lot of people who love Vegas and there are other people who, who really don't like Vegas. And so we're appealing to both groups. It's a conundrum, right? <clears throat> um, how much of the idea for Freedom Fest is based on the Mount Pelerin Society? I wrote to you that I was uh, I was jealous that you went to um, you went to their meeting 
actually we had to postpone this this talk because yeah. you were on your way to the Mount Pelerin Society. I think a lot of people who are either reading or uh, listening to this don't won't know what that is. Uh, so yeah, can so you explain explain what it is? And and I was like, I I think I wrote to you. I'm jealous that you're going. <laughs> yeah. So it's one of those exclusive groups by invitation only uh, as a membership. Mount Pelerin is society is a international group of economists, of political thinkers, uh, uh, authors, professors. Uh, you, you can be invited by a member to come. Uh, so if you wanted to come, I could uh, arrange through my membership to have you come as a guest. And after, after a, a, a guest and appearing a couple of times, you can come up for possible membership. Uh, so it's very different from Freedom Fest. I mean, Freedom Fest is more open. Uh, anybody can attend as long as you pay the price. Uh, but Mount Pelerin is a private meeting, you know, similar to Davos, for example, World Economic Forum, except the World Economic Forum is much bigger. Uh, we usually have several hundred people. We had 400 people at uh, the meeting in Oslo, uh, Norway. Um, and uh, it's, uh, it was founded in 1947, the year of my birth. Uh, so I've always had a special attachment to the Mount Pelerin Society. It was created by Friedrich Hayek, the Austrian economist who worked with Ludwig von Mises and Milton Friedman, and he'd been friends with all of them. And he invited uh, all of them to, their 39 showed up at their first meeting in Mount Pelerin, in Switzerland, a mountain resort. And they just decided to name the society after the location rather than naming it after an individual. Uh, and they meet every year at one place or another all around the world. And what I like about it is that when you come to the meeting, you're meeting people from all over the world. And so you don't have to go to those countries to find out what's going on. They all meet together. So I met up people and had lunch and dinner with people from Japan, from Australia, uh, from Latin America, uh, from Europe, uh, from Canada, from the United States, uh, just, uh, and it's all in English, uh, no matter where we are. So we were in Norway, uh, and we also have a, we learn about this, the country we're in, and we talk about current problems and how to deal with these problems. So it is a wonderful occasion to meet meet up with people and and uh, from all over the world. We've we've been go I've been a, I've been going since 1988. Milton Friedman was the person who invited me to join. Uh, went to Tokyo, the meetings in Tokyo, and I've been going to all of these meetings ever since. And uh, the next and I've been a member since 20 uh, 2002. So for 20 years I've been a member. And I've been involved with the program and I've been a speaker and uh, attendee. And so it's, it's really a lot of fun. Well, I might take you up on your, uh, your offer to have me as a guest. Absolutely. Our next uh, meeting is in, uh, is actually in Bretton Woods oh, really? uh, in New Hampshire. Uh, and we're going to have a discussion on monetary policy and, and uh, inflation and all of those uh, situation. And then the following year, the general meeting is going to be in New, Tel New Delhi, India. So uh, you, you, you have your choice of uh, either one or both. <laughs> um, the, that's, that, it's appropriate for Bretton Woods, obviously, because Hayek, um, like his motive for the first meeting of Mont Pelerin in Mont Pelerin, was um, was because the World War II had just concluded and Bretton Woods had just started, right? <laughs> and, but no, the Bretton like, Woods Agreement was actually in 1944, so it was right, actually- but so it, it was like a couple years later and, and yeah, uh, yeah. It, the way I understand it anyway, I never met him, but Hayek was uh, uh, obviously a, a big influence at Cato where I worked for a number of years and and yeah, um, yeah. and put together the forums in the Hayek Auditorium. <laughs> uh, yeah, but, I, I, but his con his uh, concern yeah. at the time in 1947 was that um, 
the post-war governments were not um, including freedom and liberty mm -hmm. for individuals and individual um, uh, achievement into the into the plan. But we, we've still had like very autocratic and uh, totalitarian ideas about government at that time. Absolutely. In fact, uh, that was Hayek's and, and the others' primary worry that socialism was dominating uh, in the UK. They, they had removed Churchill for Attlee and, uh, you know, you had uh, Harold Lasky encouraging India to adopt national socialism, which they did. There's lots in uh, Latin America rejected foreign investment and adopted uh, socialistic. So it was, it was all around the world and, uh, and I, I salute uh, Hayek for putting this together to, to kind of turn the tide, if you will. Uh, in fact, Milton Friedman said in the, I think it was in the 1990s, he says, oh, we've, we've been so successful now in reversing the tide that I think we can discontinue the Mount Pelerin Society. And of course, obviously there have been additional crises since then and government's only gotten bigger. So it's still a very much a challenge uh, and, and we need to stay in existence as well as Freedom Fest to reverse the tide. Yeah, that's like uh, Francis Fukuyama saying it's the end of history because the, the wall came down and Soviet Union disbanded. <laughs> we know yeah, that the yeah. history has not ended. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Unfortunately, we're, we're still being challenged by uh, the 2008 financial crisis, the 2020 mm -hmm. pandemic. I mean, what What's going to be next? Nuclear war. I mean, uh, war with China, the the Russian Ukraine. I mean, that's uh, there's some pretty shocking things that are happening that uh, will keep us all busy uh, in the. You know, I've I've lived now th three quarters of a century, which is hard for me to say. I still am active, by the way. I I still play basketball, and I'm going to go golfing later today with my son. So. Uh, uh, I, I hope to stick around for a whole century. Who knows? Yeah, well, I hope to have you back on the Wigan session so we can talk. I want to talk to you more about Freedom Fest um, prior to what what are the dates for it? Just so I can uh, the get dates it. are, yeah, uh, July 12th through the 15th in uh, the Memphis Convention Center. Okay. Um, and we, uh, you know, we always try to get a big name speaker and we're working on that right now. And uh, uh, our theme is the soul of liberty. What is the soul of liberty? Because uh, Beale Street in Memphis is famous for its uh, uh, its, uh, oh, okay. its music, and so uh, we we really look forward to everybody coming together at that time uh, in, next year. And if people go to freedomfest.com, they can find out all the information about that. Great. All right. Well, I'm going to have you back on before that because I want to promote it, and I will, will I'll probably attend. I don't know. That would be great. We'd like to have time. you on the program. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Let's talk about that. Okay. All right. All right. Thank you, Mark, and happy birthday. And uh, hope you hit the links well. Okay. Thanks again, Addison. All right. All right.